All I want to do is zoom, 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 zoom. <laughs> boom, boom. Boom, boom. All I want to do is a zoom, zoom, zoom. Just shake your rump. <laughs> <laughs> Ready to ride along for another exciting episode of No Driving Gloves, where Derek, John, and Will will use over 75 years combined industry knowledge to bring you a bare knuckled view on the collector car hobby. So let's get rolling. We got a interesting episode, I think, ahead of us for this week. But have you guys done anything special, interesting, exciting, wonderful, worth telling anybody about? Or are we going to sit in silence for 30 seconds? I vote for silence. Silence would be easy to edit. Actually, it's pretty hard. The sound of silence is rough. Yeah, that was it's a good a, song. That was a pretty good I'll song. Say that a Depeche Mode song? or uh, No, uh, um, Simon and Garfunkel there. No. Funkler? What? Did you say Simon and Garfunkler? <laughs> Simon and Garfunkel there. Okay. I was just making sure there. <laughs> It must be that awesome internet service you got. Yeah. It's that northern accent, damn Yankee. It, that is true. That is true. I will give you that. You can take the boy out of Michigan, but you can't take Michigan out of the boy. Truer words have never been spoken, sir. <laughs> Man, I've just had the normal week. Nothing uh, Nothing crazy. Uh, well, I say nothing crazy, nothing that I'm going to discuss on the podcast. Uh, we discussed it earlier, and that's enough. Um, but, you know, just a pretty normal week of a small business owner, you know. Nothing real outlandish, just trying to get geared up for SEMA here in a couple of weeks and go out there and make some stuff happen. It's where the movers and shakers will be. Well, no, I I had one of those typical weeks trying to get everything back in place. I don't think I mentioned last week, but we ha- or in last week's show, but I got through the Vintage Festival motorcycle thing at Barber's. Little hurricane scare during that weekend, kind of a, made for a hectic weekend, but seemed everybody enjoyed it. A couple ten thousand people came hung out with us, sold a lot of used parts, had a good time. So this. There was some days off in be- <laughs> between there and some relaxing and finishing up working on my uh, building and shop so that I can do some things other than cars and have room to put the car in the garage. Otherwise, I think I was kind of that that boring old person also. Yeah, I had a slow week. Um, nothing really exciting. Did do the antique tractor show that we talked about previous episode and uh had a good time I heard there. you had a good time there yeah yeah i actually did <laughs> and uh, other than that had some visitors from past lives come visit me at the corvette museum and just showed them around and uh hopefully actually it'd be nice to have one of them possibly on the uh, podcast as an interview so considered by some out there to be uh, the gentleman that has one of the most eccentric car collections in the country. So it would be uh, interesting to have him on the show. So we may have to work that in sometime. We'll have to talk about that. We need to get some interviews going. Uh, I've got one coming up, I think, scheduled. I've mentioned him on the, the show before. Good old Zeke. Man of Money was 9, 10 years old. He's 14, I think, now. And Delivered at one of his motorcycles to uh, Brian Fuller at the uh, Vintage Festivals at, at Barber. Fuller kind of taught him how to weld, and now he's building bikes for Fuller. So it's not a bad little thing for a, a 14-year-old who seems to have found his path in life even quicker than Jordan did in the interview episode with her. I, I forgot to mention one thing last. Last Friday, I did. You actually. forgot to mention it. You can't talk about it now. All right, that's fine. That's good. Carry on. Well, I'm now curious. <laughs> he forgot <laughs> to mention that he's still trying to find his calling in life, unlike Z. That's right. Yeah, I wish I, I wish I could figure out what to do. No, Friday, um, actually made a, a trip up to 
through Nashville, stopped at, uh, dropped some stuff off at the uh, chrome plater that we use, advanced plating in Nashville, and then went on up to Bowling Green for the uh, Good Guys Nostalgia Nationals. Unfortunately, I didn't get to uh, see Derek, but, you know, we were just up there for a few hours and then turned around and came home. So the uh, the gold 32 sedan that we used, they had, good guys had used it in a lot of their advertisement for that show. So I was like, well, we're going to Nashville. We might as well just shoot on up to Bowling Green for a few hours and uh, see some people I hadn't seen in a while and uh, attend uh, a good guys event there for a few hours. And, and then we turned around and came home. Is that the gold 32, like A, that's... You got the shorties on it and stuff. Yeah. So yeah, the 30. one that the one that just coincidentally I put put a picture up from the last Good Guys event I think you had it at. Uh, yeah, that a picture video up on the Instagram page today. Yeah, that was last year in Columbus. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. So. That, well, I knew it was Columbus. I saw the train in the background, but yeah, yeah, yeah. That was so uh, today for you listeners is October eighteenth. If you want to go back to our Instagram page and see that car Will's talking about. You know, kind of speaking of throwing stuff on stuff up on social media, I was on my personal Facebook page, and I've got a friend who's done some sheet metal work for the museum in the past named Steve Hall. And for the life of me, I am drawing a blank on the name of his shop tonight and knew it all day long. Uh, the panel shop, duh, what a moron. He's up in Connecticut. Uh, Steve trained back in the 70s with uh, Aston Martin in England, imported himself in the late 70s, you know, apprenticed with Aston Martin, was a panel beater for him, and has taken that to restoration in the New England area and now nationwide. And we've talked in the last couple episodes a little bit about coach building and how it's a missing art. And he threw a post up today of this little, this buck that he's building. And I like to think of myself, because I, I like to overqualify myself, qualify myself for a lot of things, but as a maker, and I do woodworking on the side, and I can kind of sort of maybe do some metal shaping and kind of sort of maybe get some pieces of metal to stick together and call it a weld, things like that. But Steve can actually kind of do it all. So I threw, threw this buck up, which they built in his shop. And it, it's a perfect buck. It's for a 1953 uh, Siata, S-I-A-T-A, something like that. And then he'll go on and he'll shape aluminum around it, panel form it with hammers and, you know, anneal it and roll it and, you know, end up with a car body out of it. I mean, he basically builds car bodies from scratch. It's one of these things we've touched on in episodes before and, with the opportunity of discussing the coach builders and, you know, buying chassis from Duesenberg or buying chassis from Bugatti's and then going places and having bodies built, I kind of wanted to expand on it and dwell on it and give all three of us a chance to discuss coach building. Derek, you can bring to light some of the history behind it and some of the the cool stuff and the bodybuilders and will you know you discussed recently getting your power hammer and you've got a quarter of your main shop building devoted to sheet metal work and panel forming and discussed in the last episode creating fenders for a 42 or 43 chevy pickup the way you felt they should be designed as opposed to what chevy actually sold you which you said is like a dodge fender which I don't think came out until 53, really, for this <laughs> traditional Dodge step-side fender. You know, I just thought it would be a good good conversation. Get us back into that core. Let's discuss some collector car hobbyists. Hopefully this just doesn't hit a dead, wa- dead wall and we quickly come up with something else. But I was going to say, you know, I we talked a little bit on this, you know, coach building in one of the previous episodes. I don't know if we dug in really deep to it. We, we talked about some cool things with what Will does. We talked a little bit about the history and the more I thought about it, even after the episode and in what John just talked about, I think 
to be clear, because I don't, obviously I don't want to take credit away from any of the guys that have the talent to do this work. Steve Hall, there's some other guys out there that I, I won't mention by name, but John and Will and I probably all know them. They're extremely talented and they are doing the art of coach building. And I think what I was in one of our previous episodes, what I was alluding to is not necessarily that coach building is completely gone in the aspect of someone taking a buck and forming the metal around it, but the artistic end of bringing a chassis in from an automobile manufacturer, having a designer on staff that draws a completely new unseen body and then it's taken into the buck form and then turned into panels and and put together in a shop. There's not really anyone doing that anymore. And that was kind of the artistic side of it that I think has been lost. But it's it's still incredible what the guys are doing with building recreation, reproduction bodies and panels on handmade bucks that are made to recreate these bodies you know the Seattle body that uh, john mentioned you know one of my other friends that john and will probably both know you know he has formed full mg bodies that guys have come to him and said i want the new body for this chassis and i can't get it anywhere else and it's just it's an incredible talent to have and like I say, I think there are still coach builders, coach workers out there. I think it's unfortunate that we've lost the design artistic end of creating an an entirely new body that no one has really seen before. If that, I, Hopefully that makes sense. I kind of follow what you're saying, and that's where I'm, I want to allude to is the coach builders of the past built individual bodies. We still have wonderful styling departments within every manufacturer out there. Granted, some things look cookie cutter and things look cra- you know, crazy. And you go, why the heck did they do this? Or, boy, that's sterile and looks like a basketball. And the days of when you're being the absolute creativeness, the absolute you can create whatever you want is just kind of kind of past everything wants everybody wants to be a little bit safe with what's out there i mentioned steve by name and of course you know you had the late ron fournier and you've got uh i'm drawing a blank on his name um fournier was kind of an artist and you had the other side um what's his name can somebody help me here very metallurgy, and he would talk about the way the atoms and molecules slip by each other if you're forming a panel. He came to McPherson when we were there, Will, and did a sw- short presentation. But Oh, man, I can't remember his name. Ron Covell, that's who I'm thinking of. Yeah, Ron Covell, yeah. These these guys can, can do that, and I think they can style, but they, no offense to them, they're stuck in this rut of having to build things that already exist. And I would love to find somebody who just let's go crazy and build a car. You know, they do it with motorcycles. We had reality TV shows about them for a decade. You had Jesse James and Paul and senior and things like that, which I just read today, senior and Paul jr. Are going to have a new, new show on history channel coming out in January, new reality TV again. We do it with motorcycles, and people are willing to take that risk with motorcycles, but that's $50,000. When you do it with a car, it's a quarter million or a half million dollars on the low end to do it. It's just yeah, that, that, that would much be, more work. That would be just getting started good. You know, talking about the design side of it, most shops like mine, you know, Fournier's shop, the one he had it, most of the hot rod shops that I'm familiar with that have the equipment uh, to build a body from scratch, most of them don't have an in-house designer, so to speak, that puts it down on paper and really 
maps out everything for you. But there are a ton of talented individuals out there that I've worked with that most of these shops work with uh, in coming up with designs. And I know it's just most 90% of it is just changing the shape of uh, a 69 Camaro or a Mustang or a car that already exists. You know, most of those guys would just go, go crazy if you came up to them and said, all right, look, We've we've got the budget and we're going to build a complete one-off car. We don't want it to look like anything else. Maybe some styling characteristics from this or from that or, or this era and that era. But we're going to create our own car. And man, most of those guys would just, would would love it to, to go in and work with a shop to build that i would love to do it uh that's always been kind of a dream of mine is to you know still roll in off the off the o'neill steel truck and and when it leaves it's a car you know uh that would just be that would be freaking cool real cool to do like you said i mean you're 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 gonna be yeah, you know, you're going to be a million dollars in it if it's done at my shop. Just restyling a car to compete for a show like the Riddler or something like that. You you know, if you're going up there to truly compete for the for the award, you're you're going to be a million dollars plus. So, that's taking a car and modifying it. So, building a car from complete scratch, you know you're not just going to put some run of the mill LS motor in it for $3,500. You're going to, you're going to get pretty crazy with that too. I mean, you, you can spend 40, 50 grand just on the, just on the motor. And then the design work and the engineering side of things, man, you, you're going to be, you're going to be way on up there. Just, just on that aspect of things too. Because you're not just going to throw a Mustang two front suspension up under it either. You know you're gonna you're gonna get creative with some cantilever stuff and see what push the limits. You know that, that that's my kind of thought on it. Is is if you're going to do it, like John said, why why would you want to build it after another car? Do your own thing. Be creative and push the limits of suspension design materials. I mean, throw throw some stuff out there that that people aren't really using on cars yet. So it, it would get it would get pretty pricey real quick. The nail on the head, will with the very early in in what you just mentioned, you said shops. A lot of shops really don't have the artistic designer on staff. You know, I'll go back to the days of coach building all of those shops of course had their artistic designers then they had their buck builders their panel beaters the guys that did the the fabrication end they had the two different people and that's that's very unusual to find in shops these days like you said you know there are some shops that have them we've seen it on reality tv you know there are a few shops out there as john said most of the time in the motorcycle, the big motorcycle shops, you saw the artist, you know, creating renderings on a computer. We go back to, of course, General Motors hiring Harley Earl out of his dad's coach building shop in California to create the first design studio at a major auto manufacturer with the way things have gone in the auto industry and federal safety regulations, everything that has to be met nowadays, if you're going to be in the auto design world, it's about the only place you can go to really make a great living is to go into the design studios at the the big auto manufacturers. And there there are fantastic guys going in there, as John said. I mean, there are fantastic designers at the design studios but it's really kind of that move by General Motors, in my opinion, 
bringing in Harley Earl to create a design studio that kind of starts the decline of the coach built automobile because now you have those designers creating really quite beautiful cars at the the auto manufacturers that are coming out of you know the assembly plants mass produced the 1927 LaSalle which is the first car that Harley Earl Designs does design work on at General Motors is an absolutely gorgeous car uh, it's absolutely beautiful and it rivaled some of the you know beautiful lines of some of the coach built cars so it does factor a lot on that artistic design person that can be at the shop to create those new designs. Yep. And, you know, every hot rod shop owner is a designer, you know, I just, I I cannot draw to save nothing, you know, so I have to relay what I see in my head to somebody that can put it down on paper. And, and and that's most hot rod shops. You know, they 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 call a guy that does their renderings. They tell them what they're thinking, and then they draw. Where if you had that guy in house, and you can actually sit across the desk from somebody and really start sketching stuff out, that that's when magic happens with cars. Is when the designer. And the owner, which is also a designer, just may not can draw or or put it down on paper or something like that. When when you get a group of guys like that together, that's that's when when really cool stuff happens. We actually have a guy flying in from California after SEMA to do that here with a with a project that we got going on. Instead of a just relaying messages on the phone or email or text message. He's he's flying here for a couple of days, and we're going to put our heads together, and and he's just going to go crazy, and you know. And another good thing about that too is, yeah, we're we're restyling a car. We're not building a car from scratch, but we're, we're at, we'll be able to look at look at the car and 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 you know put tape on it, change body lines with tape and stuff like that, which you could do a one off body. You could start off with tape on the wall, you know. Yeah, you're right. That's that's where most of us lack is is having that extra hand in the shop to put your heads together and 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 move forward with it. Well, while you were talking a little bit, Will, something crossed my mind, and you were talking. It's hard to have the the designer, and then it's hard to have the budget. And it's hard to have the shop and all of that come together in in this world. And that might be a little bit of what's preventing it. But what crossed my mind is uh, good old Chip Foose. And the project that he did in, I think it was 1990, when he was at the Art Center College in Pasadena, where a lot of the people in the big three, a lot of the stylists go through and come out of the Art Center in the Pasadena Design School or whatever that's exactly called. And he designed what has been reputed as eventually becoming the Plymouth Prowler. And he took, you know, he designed this car and ground up, and he's been able to, I uh, think around 05, 07, I think I saw it in 09 at Amelia, he built the Hemisphere. Mm -hmm. which is his own design. He produced it in his shop. He built a prototype and I believe five production examples. So he, he, you know, he's, it's still not, you know, to me, a coach built car is kind of a one-off thing, but you have to pay for it. And I understand that. And I understand chip. Yeah. That's what you had to do. You had to sell five of them to have one. And I believe the project goes back to when he was with Boyd Coddington you know, he, he started it and it's been attributed with the good or bad, you know, the niche market of the PT Cruisers and the Chevrolet SSR and the HHR. Was that the other one from Chevrolet? And probably could be attributed to a lot of the retro cars that came out because I know he ended up doing Courtney Hansen's uh, Thunderbird, things like that. 
But if you go through his portfolio of cars that he's done, I believe you can go through it and, you know, everything is the chip foo style. Like you, you said, what a, a typical hot rod shop does this, you know, the 21st century takes a car, puts their signature lines on it. We discussed Troy Trepania normally does a two-tone type car. Chip is really good about panel gaps and smoothing and tucking things and just bringing everything in, you know, tighter where designers have to realize that a car guy might have this car and some 20-something on a cell phone might have this car and we've got to allow for suspension travel and curbs and speed bumps and where with the hemisphere chip didn't have to take any of that into account and it's the only thing i think that's ever that i recall ever coming out of his shop that wasn't based on anything in reality he built the frame when he was with boyd and project gets put on the side put on the side and you know by the mid 2000s 2005 2006 he was doing well well enough that he could go ahead and fund the project or he had you know a client like like you get with the car you know you've got a stylist coming in for and like the cars you've brought in stylists before that you know you've got somebody that can come in and help pay for that and create those cars so he might be as close to what we should have for a modern coach builder I think in the previous episode where we discussed this, I mean, we recapped it in the 20th episode, but in the actual episode where we discussed coach building, what drives me crazy are all the rap stars and musicians and entertainers, and we've got no problem dropping $3 million on a Bugatti Chiron that 300 other people have. They come to you with $3 million, you're not going to give them a car that can go zero to, uh, what is it, 188 miles an hour or something and back to zero in 40 seconds, whatever the Juan Pablo Montoya record that was just set with that car. You're not going to give them everything that a Chiron can give them, but you're going to give them something that's probably more noticeable and cooler than a Chiron, at least to the owner. And I think what I said in that episode, $3 million budget with Big Oak Garage or I'm going to say Chip Foose or uh, Hot Rods by Troy or any of those guys is going to get you a nice car that probably has some decent resale value even. You don't even have to worry about that. And I really wish we could start training the car people that have the funds to deviate a little bit. And I think that's where I wanted to touch on this car, this coach building or custom car craze, let's quit building modified and smooth lines and just anything, you know, Will's been doing, no, but but, (laughs) let's go out there, let's go go out there and get a Escalade ESV and rip the body off of it. Let's go out there and, you know, get a Tesla and rip the body off of it and get the pan and build something on top of it. You know, you could do a really freaking cool Tesla. You could do a really, I mean, you could take a Cadillac ESV, all-wheel drive, handles well, rip that GM body off of it, lower it to the ground, and you're not going to build a sports car out of it, but you could build one heck of a touring luxury limousine thing out of it that would be unbelievable. You could do the same thing with a, or they, they still call them Sprinter vans or something for Mercedes when they do the, you know, $100,000 limousine conversions, it's still a frame-on vehicle. Take the the body off and let's build a body for the thing and put your 2 or $3 million into something creative. There's a car that I want to mention that was debuted at SEMA last year built by the Ring Brothers called Madam V. And they took, uh, they took a newer Cadillac. I'm not exactly sure what your model Cadillac it was. Uh, they built a car for a guy named Wes Rydell, and they rebodied this new Cadillac with an old Cadillac body, but they really changed the, it was, I'm thinking it was a 50s Cadillac. I'm not 100% on that. I just pulled it up. It was a 48 48. Cadillac. Okay, 48, 48. So 
you know, that's pretty close to what you were just talking about. Other than they didn't completely hand make the body, they hand made a ton of pieces for the car. But they did. They they. I, I'm not a big fan of the term rebodied, but uh, that's essentially what they did. When when I looked at that car at SEMA, at first I was like, I you know I don't really know. But then I got to really looking at it, and I'm like, dude, why not? Why not take something new, put the old body on it, or create your own body for it? And you got the modern drivability of a brand new Cadillac. I think it might even still have the airbags and, you know, all of that in it. All the safety equipment, the analog brakes, the all of the sensors. I, I'm pretty sure they used most of that stuff on that car. Say, I'm looking at the pictures of it, and it seems to be built with a lot of ATS components. Uh, turbo V6 in it, which is surprising to me. And looking at the interior, it's the interior of an ATS. Now, yeah. I mean, it looks like the airbags are still there. Whether or not they're there in function, I don't know. But that's kind of kind of what I'm saying. They seem to do it a lot with uh, Corvettes. It seems to be really popular. I was just reading an article today where somebody took a 01 Z06 and put a solid axle, I think 60 or 61 Corvette body on it. You know, I'm sure Derek's seen a few of those come through where people have put the money into them and really done it. And they've made, you know, taken that old styling and made it new again. And that's why not? You've got the cool of the old and you've got the, the convenience and the usability of the new. And then obviously with what I'm seeing the Ring Brothers did, I'm not a to be honest, I'm not a big fan of the grill treatment looking at the pictures. I'm, but, I'm with you on that. But um, it seems to be, I mean, you can see where the ATS is in that car, though. I mean, that that is a modern V-series Cadillac grill pattern. You can see some of the carbon fiber in that that they've done. If you're going to do it, do it right. I mean, I'm going to say if, if I got into that, the 66 uh, Impala you did, well, I'm sure that's going to drive and operate a lot like a modern vehicle does. Uh, same thing with the Dart we mention all the time because it seems to damn near have a new Challenger interior. Um, if you watch the reality TV shows with, um, is it Ryan Friggenhaus or whatever his name is, um, with West Coast Customs, yeah. they did the Charger rebodies where you drop a 69 Charger on a new Charger and or and you end up with brand new car that looks old, which... Again, it's still a phenomenal thing, but it's still not, it still looks like, you know, it looks cool up close, but driving down the road, I'm not going to know if it's a 69 Charger or a 69 Charger on a, you know, 2016 Hellcat chassis. Yeah, the cool thing that you mentioned there, John, you, going back to Madam V, you said, yeah, you know, I'm not crazy about the, the grill treatment and will was like yeah i agree that's the cool thing i think about coach building is that there's the one-off unique features and not everybody's gonna like it you go back to the the early days of of coach building and though coach builders did beautiful work sometimes they had customers that wanted certain things and there are some cars out there that don't always look the best from the early days that are coach built. Uh, just a couple that come to mind, if anybody wants to take the time to research them, are some of the cars that Fatty Arbuckle had coach built. It was definitely Fatty Arbuckle's taste going into that car. It was not always the coach oh, builder. And I, I've seen some of the Fatty Arbuckle stuff. and uh, Yeah, it's <laughs> it's not very attractive, but it's coach building and it's what he wanted and it's the look that he was going for. And that's, I think that's one of the cool things about coach building exactly what you were talking about. Do the one off, do the unique thing, do what you or your customer thinks looks cool. And it, it doesn't look like anything else out there. And that's, that's really kind of the cool part of coach building. In my opinion, it just, it makes it, it makes it its own car. And I think what you said is the reason we don't see more of it, because it's 
not not to pick on the Ring Brothers. They build fabulous cars. I don't like the grill. Will doesn't particularly care for it. You you call it unique, and that's what people are afraid of. I'm going to design something. I'm going to spend lots and lots of money on it. It's going to get done, and then my friends are going to look at it and laugh. I'm afraid of that. I want something that it's kind of like we went to the the retro, we, you know, when the retro styling with the major manufacturers. We, you know, the the new Mini, the new Beetle, the Thunderbird, the Mustang, and so on and so on. We knew those were designs that would work. They were designs that we could sell. So the manufacturers ran with them, and they sold the hell out of them. They sold a bunch of them. Doesn't matter. They sold a lot of SSRs, even though. They claim they didn't sell a lot of SSRs. They still sold, what, 10,000 of the things. People liked them and people enjoyed them. And they're money in the bank. And you have a custom shop builds you a custom 67 Camaro or a custom 65 Mustang or a bullet recreation and put a modern drivetrain in it. You know you're going to have somebody to sell that car to. Or your family is when you're gone. Somebody's going to buy that car. But if you sit down and you build something out of your head, and God forbid you come up with something like Will I Am did with um, his DeLorean, whatever Will I Am creation that you haven't seen a lot of pictures of, and there's a reason. I think it's one of those cars that actually breaks the camera when you take a picture of it. You, you create something that's just hideous. And then you're stuck with something you put a lot of money into that nobody wants. You're ashamed to be seen in. And I know, no, unfortunately, I know a couple people that have put seven figures into a car and then were embarrassed by the car. Not that, you know, sometimes it's what the car looked like. Sometimes it's the fact they put so much money into a car and they didn't want people to know they put that much money into a car. It's a sad thing to see. Tom Cruise saying from uh, Risky Business, sometimes you got to say what the heck and take some chances. Sometimes you you got to say what the heck and take some chances. Exactly. You know what I say? I say suck it up, buttercup. If it makes you happy and you like it, then do it. That's right. And Who cares what anybody else thinks? That's what's wrong. We shouldn't care what other people think. That's right. I I was thinking the same thing, John. You know, the, the, the modern day society... It's go get an iPhone, go live in the subdivision, go buy yourself an LTZ Tahoe. You know, you want to be like everybody else, keeping up with the Joneses. It's not being creative in what you drive or creative in the house that you build or, or anything. It's 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 doing what the guy next door done. That's a, it's almost modern day society for you right there. Live in the subdivision have a house on the river and drive what everybody else drives and not be different, blend in. The funny thing is a lot of the people that can afford this stuff, us three not being three of those people, I believe. Definitely. A lot of them made laid, made their money taking risks. I mean, uh, even though it existed before it really came out, whoever invented the Snuggie, could come and go out and buy that. It's a stupid invention. It's a blanket with sleeves, but they made a lot of money. They took a risk on it. They put a lot of money into that, but you're right. Then they live in the cookie cutter McMansion with their, you know, Escalade that the dealer had in stock, most likely. And just everything else is very conservative and protecting what they created, but they took a risk to get there. What's wrong with taking another risk? I use a saying quite often in that expense is proportionate to income. And while I'm not going to say what I make, but pretend, you know, I made $40,000 a year and I bought a well-equipped Honda Accord, I spent 20 grand on that car or 22. I spent 50% of my income on a car. If I make three and a half million dollars a year, and I spent 50% of my income on a car, what, you know, it's not, yeah, all you accountants out there will go crazy and your financial planners, but it's the same thing. Make three and a half million dollars a year on a car or a year, I should be able to spend 1.75 on a car. I still got $2 million to play with and 
you know, pay the power bill, put food on the table and go to Taco Bell. But it's the same thing. It's proportionate. I mean, you spend 50% of my income so I can have a Honda, or if you're rich, you spend 50% of your income and you could have one heck of a, a car that fits you. And the reason you've got three and a half million dollars a year to do that is because you took a risk at one point. Quick, you know, sometimes, again, say what hey, but, the heck and take a chance. But risk is scary, John. I mean, I, I shouldn't give this away, but I've always been afraid to to try my idea, which is is this little thing called a sluggy, which is a blanket that punches you when you start to fall asleep during your favorite show. It's just it seems risky. <laughs> oh, you know, you mentioned Will I am earlier, and you know he's one of the few people out there that's had a couple of cars completely built from basically scratch. You know, which is what we've been talking about. Um, he has a lot of custom cars, but I think he's actually had two cars that were either his design or somebody else's design that, that, um, that he had made. One was that DeLorean thing. And then the other one was the blue. I mean, I don't even, I don't even know what to compare it to, you know? Um, heck even DeLorean himself did it. You know, he had an idea and he stood up to the big wigs and he stood up to, to everybody and tried it and depending on whose book you read and whatever there's a new one and I need to buy it before it goes out of print that you know he might have been excuse the term but snowballed and pushed aside and whatever and set up and you know his his incident at the Marriott and you know the day he was arrested he had his executives had found the funding to continue the car company and possibly save the car company. You know, unfortunately it was the days before cell phones and he wasn't reachable. And depending, you want to believe he was either doing the drug deal to save the company or he was doing the drug deal as a setup and we didn't know that was going to happen. Whichever side of the fence you sit on, I have my opinions, you have yours. You know, he, he's one of the last guys to really, try it on a manufacturer standpoint. I guess this shows went to us preaching to maybe somebody come out there and take some risks. Let's get back to this coach building. Let's get back to instead of letting mix a lot rap about the benzos and the you know, you've got a phantom with a big gold grill and all this customizing you're doing to cars that everybody else has trying to be unique. Let's be unique. Let's bring some of this custom bike building into the car world. Like I said, yeah, it's 50000 to a couple hundred thousand million dollars, but it's it's the same thing, and it's something that's more usable. And I just think it's an industry that's there, and somebody's got to try it. We need to bring it back. You know, there's so many, so many creative people out there that are held back because... There's people there that aren't willing to take the chance. I mean, if if you're paying, okay, in the news this week is the guy that's going to jail for five years for punching a $10 million painting, putting a hole in it. It's a $10 million painting. What can you do with it? Seinfeld loves to discuss fine art and his kind of hatred, I believe, of fine art. And it doesn't make sense to pay $10 million for a painting, but he's got the world's best Porsche collection. (laughs) <laughs> it's you look at your art differently and I've always said I would rather have a 30 million dollar Ferrari in the garage if I could afford it than a 30 million dollar painting hanging on the wall because if I go broke I can drive that 30 million dollar Ferrari to McDonald's and get a paycheck that 30 million dollar painting is not going to do anything for me if you know if we have an apocalypse and everything goes away that $30 million Ferrari potentially could get me somewhere. It might look like a Mad Max thing. That $30 million Monet is not going to do much. You know, John, you talk about taking a risk and starting up something with coach building. And I think during our last episode about this topic, we came up with a business plan. And we're talking about taking risks. So, you know, Will, maybe it's just time. Maybe it is just time we enact our business plan from a couple episodes ago. 
Hey, hey, I'm ready. I've got the facility. I've got a lot of the equipment. I'm just waiting on y'all's y'all y'all to invest and let's roll. What was your your role in this, Derek? I think mine was the sales. I need to bring the client in. You are going to. I, I think I was the chassis end of things. Yeah, yeah, you're the chassis man. Procuring the chassis, getting them to you know spec they need to be, and then getting them ready for will to body. Done. We got a sales manager. We got a chassis manager. We got a body manager. Let's roll. Vista Print, here I come. I got I got Gavin, one of the best painters in the country, that's been working with me for over ten years. Got our body man. Let's let's go. So all of our listeners that would like to invest, uh, our Patreon page. <laughs> We we don't need investors. We just need one solid client that's willing to take the risk and prove our concept. There you Kevin go. O'Leary, you're out there. Or should we be going for um, Hershevec because he is a car guy? It doesn't matter to me. Whoever. I don't care whose name it is. <laughs> that's right. You can be anonymous. I don't and, care. And- and saying Hershevec, it just clicked. Do you know who's still doing this and who is still doing coach build it, built cars? Without a doubt. No. Ferrari. Because didn't they just build Eric Clapton? Oh, yes, I heard about okay. Eric Clapton's got some bad-ass rides. Did, he just did like a $5 million custom Ferrari where they, they took a 458 Italia which is, again, rebodying a car, put a whole new body on this thing and created uh, something that was very reminiscent of a 70s Merlin at a boxer. And it was cool. He took the risk. Granted, he's doing it with a Ferrari. He's doing it with a Ferrari built by Ferrari. Don't think there's a Ferrari that's worthless. I mean, I saw a 400i Ferrari price today for like $59,000. That's the car that... I think it's only TV role or movie role was at the beginning of uh, Tom Cruise. And um, it's Are the only about Rain Man. Exactly. At the very beginning of Rain Man, Tom Cruise is driving a Ferrari 400i. And that's the only scene I remember from it. I don't even remember the name of the movie. You know, every Ferrari is eventually worth some money, but Ferrari will do this. And I guess I guess if we started to look at some sheiks and things like that, you might find that um they they have some of these custom one-off cars and things like that. Where are they in the US? Where are they in the show circuits? We 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 need to see them. They need to be out there. I got another car I want to bring up that Eric Clapton owns that I absolutely fell in love with several years ago. And it, it, it goes along the lines of kind of what we're talking about. It's a, a 32 Ford Victoria four-door. So they never made a four-door Victoria. But, man, if you if you look at this car, if Henry Ford would have built a four-door Victoria in 1932, I mean, this this is the way it would have been styled. This is the body that it would have been. I, I mean... It is it is absolutely awesome. Uh, granted, it is a street rod. It's lowered with wire wheels and things like that. But uh, Roy Brizio built it for him. I just and, just pulled it up. I mean, that's that's a, that's a one off car. I mean, granted, it, it is kind of based off of a thirty two Ford, uh, but they never made a four door Vicky, you know. Um, and man, that car in person is absolutely. I mean, the pictures don't do anything for it. You know, it's it's a absolutely stunning car to look at. And according to their website, it's the uh, third car that Clapton had built, I believe, for, there, by, there's by, pro- by by Roy. Yeah, Roy Brizio's built built Eric Clapton several cars, and uh, Roy Brizio builds a good car too. So I guess they're out there. We just need to. Locate these clients and get Derek working on a chassis, and Will's got well, the artist to put the and, uh, pen know, to paper. Going again on where are they in the U.S., 
recently, I don't remember, it was within the last, say, I want to say within the last four to five years, Alfa Romeo did the, was it the the 4C, I think it was? They took one and and completely coach-built a body on it. It's going to be impossible to find if it's a 4C, because it's going to be all the... The Disco Volente. Disco Volente. The Alfa Romeo Disco Volente, which I think is built on a 4C chassis, but it's completely coach-built body. There it is. Yeah, simply known as the Alfa Romeo Disco Volante, uh, or Italian for flying saucer. Built which on... is just a beautiful, I think, beautiful lines, beautiful look to it. I, I think it's 4C chassis, is it not? Alfa Romeo 1900 C52 Disco Volante. Three Spiders are made in 1952, so this is the real car. Well, I'm talking about the modern one they did. The the new one, yeah. Man, that thing's pretty awesome. <laughs> 2013. Oh, I, I found it. It's built off the 8C, which is the current car. Two-seater coupe okay, built okay. by uh, apologies. Car- Carrozia Touring in 2013. It is based on the Alfa Romeo 8C Competition or whatever. There's a Facebook video out there to learn how to pronounce these account- car names. You know, <laughs> find it, do we it yourself. Don't watch them. I don't even read all the letters and words, as many of you have probably noticed with my speaking abilities. There are too many vowels between consonants for John. I don't know if it's vowels between consonants or consonants or just letters. <laughs> but anyway. Too, too many double letters. But yes. Anyway, the so I, I Alfa guess... Romeo Disco Volante is an absolutely stunning coach-built car. But again, we're looking at a non-U.S. coach-building situation. One-off by a manufacturer, and I guess if you want to get into that, enjoy the New York Auto Show, Chicago Auto Show, etc. L.A. Auto Show. I want to see if some people build this stuff and put them on the road and enjoy them. I want to be the guy that builds them so they can put them on the road and enjoy them. I think it would be just, you know, like I said earlier, it, it's kind of a dream to, you know, take a car and build it from scratch, you know, call it whatever you want to call it. it it's your vehicle. It's it's your design. It's, uh, it, it's completely, there would never be another one like it, you know. And I'm going to be the guy that just rides the coattails and says I was involved. Yeah! (laughs) Well, we're on record as discussing it and being the first people really publicly to say it. The power of the podcast. Copyright, trademark, patent pending. (laughs) There's an interesting discussion we've had about coach building and how we feel it should fit into the modern world. We didn't get into much of the history of it, other than it is an important portion of the past with automobiles that for some reason has been forgotten by the current people who would have had coach-built cars back in the day. I think with that, we'll go ahead and close up the show. Do you guys have anything you want to add? I'm good, man. Just hope everybody enjoyed the show and enjoy the week. So just remember, go ahead and check out our social media, check out our Patreon, any of the little things out there. Check out the website. If you're going to Amazon to buy anything, go through go through the website, click a link, throws a couple bucks our way, throws a couple, you know, a couple bucks kind of your way. It's a way to support us and we can do some some more things, get out there. We've bought some new gear. We're trying to work into the show, trying to make it a little bit better and get out. Maybe that'll come around in the near future. So with that, we'll wrap it up this week and chat with you guys later.